money is essential for keeping a robust flow of economic activity going. In a world without money, I would be standing outside the gates of Wellesley College, the institution where I have taught for the past 20 years, holding a sign that says, have economics, need chocolate. I would be waiting, forlornly at times, for a passerby carrying a board that says, have chocolate, need economics. This is what economists call a double coincidence of wants. I want what you have, and you want what I have. But money is a medium of exchange that cuts through this double coincidence of wants. In effect, it allows me to metaphorically carry around a board that says, have economics, need money, meet up with my employer, whose board says, have money, need economics, and then take my new board, which says, have money, need chocolate, and walk to my favorite store in town, which does in fact have a board that says, have chocolate, need money finding easier and easier ways for people to use this medium of exchange. Debit cards, credit cards, Venmo, Apple Pay has become a key feature of the modern economy. Money has been an essential part of economic interactions from the very dawn of civilization. In the ancient cities of Mesopotamia, people used silver as money to buy goods they needed for daily economic activity. The term shekel which meant one third of an ounce of silver, came into use at that time as the first known form of money. Gold, silver, and bronze coins were used in ancient civilizations in China, India, Egypt, and Asia Minor. These coins played an important role in increasing economic activity because they could be carried around easily, were durable, and could be easily divided into smaller units properties that we use even today to characterize what can be used as money. Money was also useful for political influence and control. The images of kings and rulers were placed on coins. Taxes could more efficiently and easily be collected from the populace in the form of coins, which in turn could be used to attract more soldiers for armies to conquer new lands or to defend existing ones. But money was not always synonymous with precious metals. Furs in cold climates, livestock for milk, meat, and animal hides, salt along inland trade routes are all examples of commodities that were used as money because of the intrinsic value they provided. In fact, the word salary, which comes from the Latin word for salt, remains an integral part of our economic vocabulary today. Some forms of money were even more exotic. Shells were used as money in both North America and China. In the South Pacific island of Yap, giant stone wheels that weighed more than a ton were used as money. In Eastern Europe, behind the Iron Curtain, vodka became a valued commodity currency, since it could be exchanged for Western goods when mere paper money in the form of Russian rubles or East German marks could not. In prisoner of war camps in World War II, the currency of choice was cigarettes. Whereas in prisons today, packets of mackerel fillets are used as money to trade goods and services. Mackerel rose to prominence after smoking was prohibited in prison, and prisoners were no longer allowed to buy cigarettes at the prison commissary. Economists think of money as performing three functions in the economy. Money serves as a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. The medium of exchange refers to the willingness of someone to accept the money in exchange for the good or service they have to offer. This is what economists consider to be the most important defining feature of money. For instance, if you went shopping at the local mall with bags of salt, cans of mackerel, or cartons of cigarettes, or a prized milk cow, chances are you would not be leaving the mall with the latest fashions from Zara or a new Xbox game from GameStop, because the owner of the mall store has little use for a few dozen extra packs of mackerel. But if you lived at a time or in a place where those goods could be exchanged for other goods and services, then they would indeed be accepted as money. The store of value aspect is also extremely important for money. A farmer can sell her produce for money after the harvest, 
and use the money to buy things for her family during the growing season. Storing the harvest is much harder because of the costs and also because of natural spoilage. One of the reasons why cigarettes and foil packs of mackerel are valued in prison is because they have a longer shelf life than other goods that one could buy at a commissary or one was given access to in a POW camp. The store of value aspect is closely linked to the medium of exchange aspect. We also see the store of value function illustrated in currencies of countries where inflation rates are extremely high. People try to get rid of the paper currency as soon as they can because the loss of value makes it undesirable as a medium of exchange. The unit of account feature of money is that the money could be divided into smaller amounts. A metal coin with half an ounce of silver could be exchanged for two coins, each with a quarter ounce of silver, for example. But this is probably the least important attribute of money. After all, not all commodities used as money could easily be divided this way. Livestock, giant stone wheels, and unopened foil packs of mackerel are examples of money that endured despite not being very good units of account. Beginning around the 1800s, paper notes began to be used as money and soon began to overtake the use of coins. Paper money was easier to produce, transport, and divide, but had the obvious drawback of not being a commodity. There was no intrinsic value of the note itself. For people to be comfortable accepting paper money as a medium of exchange for the conveniences, they needed to be convinced that the paper money retained its store of value feature. To this extent, the amount of paper currency that governments could issue was linked by law to the supply of a commodity like gold or silver. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, many countries were on a gold standard, which meant that the price of gold in terms of paper money was fixed by the government. In the United States, under the gold standard, the price of gold was set to $21 per ounce which meant that the government agreed to buy and sell gold at that price in exchange for paper currency. The gold standard collapsed in 1933. The Bretton Woods system that began in 1945 was based on gold and the US dollar at a time when the United States controlled two thirds of the world's gold. Technically, the United States dollar was fixed to gold at a price of $35 per ounce. But this rate became increasingly difficult to maintain over the 1960s as the money supply of US dollars increased, creating a mismatch between the price at which gold could be directly bought or sold on the world market and the rate at which dollars could be converted to gold through the Bretton Woods system. The US ended dollar convertibility to gold in 1971. Other countries severed all links between their money and the dollar under Bretton Woods by 1973. As a result, the currency, the coins and paper money we use today are what we call fiat money as opposed to commodity money. The currency has value simply because people value it as a medium of exchange. If you closely examine a dollar bill, you will notice that there is nothing that says it is convertible to gold or silver or anything with intrinsic value. Instead, it says that the note is, quote, legal tender for all debts, public and private." Unquote. In other words, the US dollar is valued mostly because of its value as a medium of exchange, both now and in the future. In the modern economy, money is not merely coins and paper money. Instead, the bulk of what we consider to be money comes in the form of deposits at banks or other financial institutions. We use various instruments, checks, debit cards, Venmo, PayPal, to access this money directly for transactions, bypassing the need to first convert the bank deposits into paper money by stopping at a bank or an ATM. In the modern economy, money gets categorized by the Federal Reserve according to how liquid it is, that is, how easy it is to use in transactions. Prior to May of 2020, the official categorizations were M1, which defined currency and checking account balances held in banks by individuals and firms, as well as traveler's checks. And M2, which was defined as everything in M1, plus savings deposits, 
time deposits like certificates of deposits which cannot be accessed for a specific period of time, and other deposits where check writing is limited. Intuitively, the distinction between the two is that items in M2 that are not in M1 are not as liquid. That is, they cannot be as easily accessed and used for conducting transactions as those assets in M1. Financial innovation has always been blurring the line between what is M2 and what is M1. A young person today will not know what a traveler's check is. The widespread growth in the use of credit cards and ATM cards during the 1990s has greatly reduced what used to be a ritual of international travel. As a result, using traveler's checks for doing an economic transaction in the 2020s would be much harder than it would have been in 1990. Similarly, in mid-2020, the Federal Reserve removed the restriction of a maximum of six withdrawals a month that they had imposed on savings accounts. As a result, people could effectively access the money in certain types of savings accounts just as easily as they could access their checking account balances or the currency in their wallets. This meant that savings account balances that used to be considered as M2 were now labeled as M1. This change is vividly seen in the difference between the M1 and M2 series for the United States. Prior to May 2020, M1 was around $4 trillion and M2 was around $16 trillion. After the recategorization, M1 and M2 are almost identical at around $20 trillion. Given that nominal GDP that same year was around $22 trillion, effectively about 20 trillion units of money support $22 trillion worth of economic activity. Currency is only about 10% of the value of M2, around $2.5 trillion worth of notes and coins that circulate in the economy.